Hi everybody, it's Joey Remini from seekingbalance.com.au. I'm a vestibular audiologist and neuroplasticity therapist, and I'm very interested in helping people with invisible conditions, chronic symptoms, persistent pains and vertigo and tinnitus. And so my world is really about creating possibility for healing using the power of our brain. And I have got someone today who is really deeply enmeshed in the world of chronic pain and looking at technological solutions to help people reset and retrain their brain. So I want to introduce Brendan Lundberg to the call. So welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you, Joy. It's a pleasure. I'm honored. Yeah, yeah no, I really enjoy learning about neuroscience. I geek out a lot. I, I loved my university degree and learning about neurons and synapses and you know the emotional brain, the amygdala, the limbic system, all of these things that are starting to become kind of buzzwords you know they're yep they're in so many ted talks and i think in the next 10 20 50 years it's going to be really common tabletop language for people to have a better understanding of emotions and how they're impacting us and our behaviors and our choices and you know we're really just at the the beginning sciences of learning how are my emotions impacting me and what's this mind body connection and Mm -hmm. And even just yesterday, I had a client on an initial consult with me and, and he's like, you know, I really don't want to believe that my symptoms are related to stress, but maybe they are. And just trying to unpack that a bit and, and release the shame and release the stigma around it because, mm -hmm. you know, stress is not all bad, which we can talk about. Some mm -hmm. stress is highly functional, helps us perform better, helps us to be the best version of ourselves. And in, in many ways, we need a bit of stress in our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know if we are super chilled and relaxed and in our parasympathetic repair system all the time, we actually get lethargic and dizzy and, you know, it's not good either. We need that balance of, yep. of what's going on. So do you want to talk a little bit about what you know and what you've learned in your journey of the common pain process? Yeah. And how we can have an initial injury or something and then that can, can spiral out into chronic pain that yeah. the brain doesn't turn off. So do you want yep. to just introduce people to some of that science? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll keep it as simple as possible. And I'm not a clinician. So my, my co-founder in my business is a, is a medical doctor, but I'm a, I'm a lay person. So that'll be easy for me to Perfect. probably keep it. Pretty, so. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So uh, all pain, even though we don't experience it this way, we experience it in the tissue, like in our hands or the knees or the joints or wherever we're feeling pain. All pain is a product of the brain. And in the short term, it's a protective function. If you put your hand on the hot stove, it hurts so that you know it hurts and you pull it off before you do more damage. It also educates us to say, oh, that stove is hot and I'm going to in the future avoid putting my hand on the hot stove. Or if we have disease growing in the tissue or an injury, we want to feel pain so that we can appropriately address it and let it heal. But what happens in chronic pain is the brain essentially becomes wired to expect the pain and it starts to perpetuate the pain as the new normal experience, regardless of what's going on in the tissue. Yet most of the pain therapies that have been available uh, address only the tissue yeah. or they're a drug that has, you know, it's basically just numbing the entire system out and creating side effects and addiction. And we have this, you know, opioid addiction epidemic that's prevalent in too many societies now across the world. And so um, what we're doing is we're advancing um, a, you know, a direct-to-consumer business around technology and education and science that allows us to educate people and use technology to retrain the brain and restore the brain back to a more normalized perception of pain by giving the brain basically new information and helping the brain become a little bit more relaxed. So I just want to reiterate, in, in our brain, we have almost like a, a massive computing system. Mm -hmm. And the brain is responsible for collecting all the information that the body has all these receptors and sensory inputs everywhere. Like literally the entire skin is collecting information about temperature and orientation and gravity. And then of yeah. course we've got our ears, we've got our eyes, our taste buds, our smell, etc. The brain is collecting in all this information, including emotional information. So like Correct. if you see a person at a cocktail party and you're like, Oh my God, that's a psycho serial killer your brain will start actually giving off emotional signals it's like get out of here run yeah. fight flight freeze so the 100%. brain is com computing all of this and so if hypothetically let's say we um had a a shoulder injury what what brendan's saying is that there will be injury and inflammation to the tissue that that you know membranes and 
muscle fibers and things need to repair and they'll go through an inflammation process and all of that's a healthy part of healing. Um, but the actual pain is not felt in the tissue. Your shoulder's not capable of feeling pain. It doesn't right. actually have the capacity for pain, right? The pain actually is a signal coming from the shoulder through our brain stem and our midbrain and up into the cortical areas of the brain where it's being interpreted and perceived in a meaningful way. And so that's why so you can have two people in exactly the same scenario and one person will be like, oh my God, this is killing me. It's torturous. And another person's like, oh, it doesn't hurt me at all because you've got two different brains computing the information differently. Exactly. And even with birthing, you know, some people are in horrific amounts of pain and other people have a more easeful process because their brain is interpreting the signals differently. Right. When we feel safe, when we feel in control, when we feel informed, the brain is much more likely to say, oh, it's no big deal. I've just, I've had a little hiccup. I'll just take it easy and it, the shoulder's no problem, right? So it's very mm -hmm. relaxed. It's informed. It's taken the no big deal approach. That's when the pain is likely to be a lot less severe. However, when we're like, oh my God, no one can diagnose it. What's going on? This huge amount of uncertainty. How long is this going to last? Will I ever get better? That's when the brain can get itself into a pickle. It can create loops that refire pain and go, well, we can't figure it out yet. So we've got to fire more of this so we can learn about it. We've got to fire more of it so we can study it. We've got to fire more of it so we can get over yeah. it. And so we start to fire this chronic pain loop, which is the, the shoulder itself can actually heal and all the inflammation go down. And that's kind of resolved six weeks ago. But the brain is still firing the memory of it and the dilemma of it because it's caught in a trauma loop, fight, flight, yep. freeze, sympathetic nervous system. Yep. Um, I don't even know if we fully understand every aspect of this process. I mean, it's very complex and that's something that I really like about neuroscience in the brain is it's very multi-layered. Each person mm -hmm. does have individual differences. But when we, we simple it down to allowing the brain to recreate safety, and when we teach the brain and educate the brain, well, actually, this is okay that you feel this. It's actually an error. It's a misunderstanding. And when, when we can reset the brain to refind its, its neutral and its calm, the pain can actually disappear again permanently. Do you want to speak a little bit about that process? Um, yeah. Your understanding in layperson's terms of the science. Yeah. And a little bit about what that can look like. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. I mean, just like the phrase, we don't see the world as it as it is, we see the world as we are. We don't experience pain as pain is, we experience pain as we are. And it is multifactorial, as you've just said. Mm -hmm. uh, my co-founder, uh, Dr. David Farley, and I wrote a book, which became an Amazon bestseller um, back in, in the fall. And in the book, I make the analogy, and I think it's important to understand that we think of pain very cause and effect, and we think of it as something that is an indicator that something is wrong. Yeah. But just as you were saying, it's really an aggregation of events, what we call threat events. So the nervous system's job, its primary job is to keep us alive, which just as you were saying, it means that it's always sensing. That means vision, vestibular system, um, the touch, the feel senses, and what's called proprioception, which are our orientation in space. Inevitably, for a chronic pain sufferer, almost across the board, there's some sort of disconnect between one of those sensory systems and the brain. Like it's not computing and, and you know, interpreting that information the right way. That's part of the problem. Second is that we think, again, we think of pain very cause and effect, but a more appropriate analogy is not a cause and effect relationship. It's actually credit card debt. Yeah. And you know, we all have credit cards. And if we get a credit card, a brand new credit card, and we start buying gas and groceries and school supplies for the kids, like routine things, Everything is fine as long as we pay the bank the minimum payment or pay the credit card off every month. But if we fall behind and there starts to be an aggregation of threat debt on the account or debt on the account, now a simple event, let's say the car breaks down and I got to buy a new transmission, that puts me over my limit. And so the event is metaphorically painful, but what that experience is costing me could be made worse because now I'm over my limit. I no longer have access to that credit card. And if I was relying upon that credit card to buy gas to get to work because I don't get paid for another two weeks, then the impact, the circumstance around all of that becomes much more intense. 
So again, I mean, this is, this is what's happening in, in pain is that the nervous system has cataloged and recorded all these events, as you said, like threat experiences, because mm -hmm. it wants to keep us safe. It wants to know in the environment, just like the scary dude at the party, we want mm -hmm. to know this is a potential threat. It's recording all these things in an effort to keep us safe. But if genetics or lifestyle awareness, you know, nutrition, sleep, I mean, all these factors probably allow us to have a higher level of threat debt on our nervous system than we really need to have. And then subtle, simple things that are, you know, normally, normally just nothing that would heal and go away become the tipping point to put us into this, uh, yeah. into this loop, as you talked about. Yeah. And I was just thinking back actually to a time in my life when I was, I was just so run down. I was definitely experiencing a stage of depression in my life at this time. This is in my late twenties, I'd say mid to late twenties. I was more anxious. I was more depressed. I had heaps of instability at that point in my life. And I remember thinking like just everything's worse. Everything's like amplified mm -hmm. and things that normally wouldn't matter or would just be no big deal are suddenly like a big deal and debilitating. Mm -hmm. And that voice in, in, in my head would be like, I can't do this and I can't do that. And I'm lonely and I'm isolated and just that the neurosis kicks in. And so that mind body intersect is, you know, it's very evident, especially when you're in it. Yeah. And I think it's really important to go back to the science of recognizing, you know, we have a part of us that's like a reptilian brain. It's really old. Yep. And that's creating really automated responses. And it's, it's developed over millennia when we were cavemen and cave women. And now that we're living in a modern day world of technology, it's not, not always making the best response and best automated decision. Because we're, yeah, where in the old days, we may have been running away really from lions and I don't know, uh, environmental threats or food poisoning because we didn't have fridges, right? Yeah. So we, we were getting all of these appropriate diarrhea and vomit responses to get out the bacteria or we were getting the heart pumping and bringing blood flow to our muscles so we can run and we can fight and that was what we needed now it's like we're in a job interview we're sitting in an office and we can feel our stomach moving like we've got to go to the toilet or we're getting mm -hmm. really tense shoulders and tense pelvis and we're clamping up because we're sitting in an office waiting for a job interview and we're not running mm -hmm. so the messages are not all kind of apt anymore and mm -hmm. so that's where we have to come into that neocortex and the modern brain. And this, this is our outer brain and particularly our frontal lobe. And it's developed more recently. And it's what makes us able to use Excel spreadsheets and plan holidays and develop really intimate relationships with different type of people. And in fact, relationships with ourselves and have metacognition, which means we can actually notice what we're thinking, notice what we're feeling and create that sense of capacity to be the observer, be the conscious, awake human yep. rather than victim to the environment. Yep. And so with this new part of our brain, that's a, that's a really key point in neuroplasticity and healing is we can actually override some of the emotional brain and reptilian brain decisions and say, hang on guys, misunderstanding the shoulders healed that dude over there that looks scary is a misunderstanding. He's actually just in Halloween fancy. <laughs> or like, ugly. You know, calm the farm. <laughs> Everything's okay. And so using this part of our brain that's very intelligent and in sync with real time, yep. we can actually disturb those error loops mm -hmm. and create an opportunity for them to refire, rewire and, and re enmesh themselves in new neural networks. Um, so yeah, this is where the education and our mindset comes into play in, in healing. So do you want to talk a little bit about, you've got this, the, the process you take people through is about exposing them and repetition to safe feelings, comfortable feelings, kind of normal feelings. Is that what you're doing? You're stimulating their body or their brain Yeah. to feel like yeah. yeah. The first thing that we do is, is talk to our clients about why they want to get out of pain. You know, uh, the, the, the reality is for some pain sufferers, it becomes so much part of their identity yeah. that their life becomes entwined with it. And there are people, they may say they want to get out of pain, but the reality is they're using their pain as a shield or a crutch to face other things in their life that they don't want to have to face. And so, you know, we don't want to spend time with them because they're not quite ready for this. So one of the first things we do is talk to people about their why, their definition of success. And we get them anchored and focused back on who they want to be as a person, their priorities, their goals, their family, the things that they, that bring them joy and help them feel lit up. You know, you know, pain 
because it hurts, it causes us to withdraw from those things. Mm. It inevitably causes sleep disruption. Mm -hmm. uh, we move less. We, you know, we're slowly becoming less and less of who we are. And then the pain medications, they may mask the pain short term. They may help, but inevitably they actually make this process worse over time. So we want to get people focused back on who they really are and who they want to be. First of all, we then educate them about the pain science that we've been talking about. And even though this is our world and we get it and it makes perfect sense to us, the average person out there doesn't know that. And in fact, most clinicians, at least in the United States and probably in Australia and probably throughout the world, yeah. are trained in pain science from the 1960s. So they're lagging behind in terms of their understanding, and they've been promoting therapies that are based upon that old science, the drug therapies and the injections and all these other things, right? Yeah, so just to reiterate that, doctors are always doing the best they can with the resources they have, but unfortunately, technology and science has evolved so much. Well, it's not unfortunate, it's fortunate, it's great. The unfortunate piece is that you can see five doctors and they'll all tell you five different things because yeah. they've been trained under a different philosophy. Some doctors will say, you can't reverse this, you can't change the brain, you're too old, blah, blah, blah. Like neuroplasticity in the body's and brain's ability to change its neural networks, you never grow out of that. That happens right until your last breath, right? Yeah. You're never too old to change your brain pathways. The impact of your mindset, your attitude, even your breathing, on your feelings and your sensory body and your physiology is huge. It's real, it's documented, it's scientifically validated. Some doctors missed all of that in their training. And so when we say, uh, I can't remember how you phrased it, but when, when you're being referred to for like, let's say massage treatments or local treatments, or you know, they're putting all the work on the shoulder, it, it, the pain is not in the shoulder, right? The only good reason to work on the shoulder would be for your range of mobility and making sure the scar tissue and everything there is, right. is, is working well for you. But for pain, it makes more sense to work on mindset, on breath work, on attitude and on education so that the brain pathways can actually reset back into that uh, Normal. normalized, normalized sensory input situation. So yeah. no, no amount of injection in your shoulder or massage therapy or chiropractic or osteo is going to help with the actual brain stuff. So I think it needs to be more of a, a team approach generally with, with chronic input, but there's also a lot of great books out there for people who can read and learn about this at home and, yeah. and, and, and really be empowered in that way too. One of the examples that we use with all of our clients, because, you know, inevitably they're very frustrated, not only because their bodies hurt and they feel like they're being betrayed by their bodies, that it's inexplicable. Their doctors haven't been to, able to explain why they hurt. They, they feel really frustrated by this lack of understanding about what, what's going on, right? And so yeah. one of the first things we do is talk about phantom pain, because in phantom pain, if the, if the tissue has been gone, the hand has been amputated. It's not about the tissue, even if they feel explicit pain in the fingers. Yeah. It's not about the tissue because the tissue is gone. So when they can understand, okay, I can see that, then we can start to, you know, we can start to educate them. What we do with our therapy is that we have a device that essentially acts like an artificial nerve and it generates a dynamic set of artificial nerve impulses that mimic natural no pain nerve signaling in the body. We attach electrodes on the skin and healthy um, tissue that's near the painful area, but it's healthy. We turn it on and we transmit it through a specific part of the nervous system called the C fibers, which is where chronic pain is transmitted. So it's not just a mask of the pain, but it's essentially giving the brain new information. Mm. And that process of giving the brain new information allows the brain to break up these associations to pain, what we call neuro tags, and to create new neural pathways. But that it's a process of repetition and exposure. And what I said before we turned on the camera and started chatting is I think it's, I think it's arrogant for any clinician of any site of any type or any business to say we're the cure because the cure, the body heals itself. The body yeah. is made to heal. And what we're doing is trying to help facilitate the path uh, of the most efficient healing in the person. And what we do with our technology is give the brain new information. It allows it to, to release, but it's the person that heals. And it's the person who then becomes empowered to say, well, if my pain can start to ease by giving my brain new information, what if I think about my, my meditation and my mindset and my mind, you know, my sleep and all the things that kind of play into how our nervous systems perceive their experiences in life. And then that's when we really see, see significant shifts of healing and health and empowerment and people no longer feel victimized. What you said before too is very true. I think for pain sufferers, um, they start to what we call or what's kind of referred to in the industry as catastrophize their pain. Yeah. And when they focus on it, they catastrophize it like, Oh, whoa, it just, it, it, 
it overwhelms the nervous system becomes a much larger thing than it really needs to be. So by, by getting people feeling better safely, getting them off of medication so they have better cognitive functioning, they can sleep better and move better, and then educating them, they become so empowered to really start to blossom in so many areas of their life. And it's a beautiful thing to be a part of. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, is like, it can feel like such a heavy burden and such a big monster, this pain, like it can just take yeah. over our inner world, our perception, our ideals, our dreams, our sleep, our sensuality, our creativity, everything can just be like wet blanketed by the fear. And I, I know there's been times in therapy when I'm, clients have been like, it's too big. It's too, I can't do this. And especially with, you know, severe tinnitus or severe vertigo, it's a similar process and pathway. Yep. Yep. Pain's not held in the body. It's really, it's living in their brain and their ears. Yep. And there's been times when I've had, I've had to actually say to people like, you can't think like that. That is actually destructive. And you've got to just like, you've got to cut those thoughts and you've got to see it. And that's why it's so important to record therapy and to see yourself and hear yourself and actually sort of gain that observer perspective where you can see your own thoughts, you can see your own pain, you can get that space totally. and then let the brain reset it until, because when we're in the pain, we can't do neuroplasticity. When we're in the fight, flight, freeze, we can't do healing neuroplasticity. <laughs> yep. The only neuroplasticity we'll be capable of will be like the destructive type that reinforces yeah. the loops. So or maybe survival at the most, and that's it. It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. And another great example of pain, which I'll share just to help get get the picture of 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 how prioritizing and importance really impacts what we feel. Is this is a horrible example, but let's go for it. Let's say someone you're in the kitchen and for somehow you get the kitchen knife and it stabs into your thigh, right? So you have a knife in your thigh. Okay, it's clearly going to cause pain. No one's going to argue with that. But at exactly the same time, for whatever reason, your little two-year-old toddler is screaming in the bath and you're afraid they're drowning, right? Mm -hmm. You will mm -hmm. not feel your thigh pain. It will be right. completely deprioritized by your brain. You will run over to the bath. You'll pick up your screaming baby. You'll make sure they're not dying. And you will literally not even notice there is a knife sitting in your thigh. Because your brain will be like, baby's much more important than my thigh, right? So where we prioritize situations directly impacts how we feel them. So 100%. I, just wanted to, I wanted to leave that with people because I think that's a really powerful indicator of how our relationship to the situation directly impacts what we feel about it. It, you're exactly right. And that's one of the, that's one of, frankly, that's one of the disadvantages of the pharmaceutical approaches to pain management. Because if we go back to the analogy that, that pain is like an, it's an aggregation of events. So it's like credit card debt. Well, drinking a six pack of beer helps us feel better about our credit card debt, but it doesn't resolve the circumstance, right? It doesn't, it, it just masks us from that. And again, catastrophizing it when pain is costing us, like, you know, if it's preventing us in the credit card analogy, preventing us from being able to access what we need to be able to get to work, to live our life, mm -hmm. then we start to take it very personal. And when it causes us to withdraw from the, you know, the relationships and the work and the productivity that bring us joy, all of that reinforces this expectation or this experience that makes the pain more painful. So yeah. you're hundred percent correct about that. And I, again, I think when, when our clients become educated about, this multifactorial aspect of this, they, it's a process. It's not overnight. Nobody can go from, you know, a life that's been really disrupted because of pain to complete resolution overnight. It is a process. I mean, anything the brain learns takes time sometimes, but uh, it's a beautiful thing to see, it, to be a part of and to see that light come on and to realize like people are empowered again to take control of their lives and to overcome those, those pain experiences. Mm. It's beautiful. Yeah, totally. And, you know, it, it can happen quickly. I do see people who have almost moments of enlightenment yeah, and, sure. and will get very quick relief very quickly. Like so, something, well, absolutely. Something changes in them. Um, but to make it habitual, that, that yeah. process generally takes time. I mean, we get better absolutely. and better at it. Oh, absolutely. Roughly. It's all about duration, intensity, and frequency of that neural signal being fired together in synchrony. So absolutely. It, and something else I wanted to to share with but it's slipped my mind um so you're based in portland oregon brendan yep and you're going to be and your website is radiantpainrelief.com yep and for people out there who are experiencing chronic symptoms the the common thing people ask is like is it possible to heal do i have to live with it is it just pain management and i'm a really big believer of getting off the pain management bandwagon mm -hmm. right stopping focused on symptoms 
and basing your success on symptoms and start looking at joys. How can I open my brain and my system up to more connections? And that's what I was going to say before is resilience and people who have better outcomes, right? Some people are just naturally born with this easy go lucky attitude and it serves them well, right? They, they bounce back quickly. And in many ways, I think I've cultivated that consciously because I'm naturally super anxious and <laughs> I was always that little cautious kid who had heaps of asthma attacks and I would get anxious if I didn't know where my mom was. So I'm naturally anxious and I've had to learn how to reverse that natural characteristic in myself and ways that we recover more elegantly and quickly are as simple as hang out with people who uplift you, like create communities and environments and belonging where you feel loved, you feel accepted, you feel your eccentric quirks are okay, right? Mm -hmm. Surround yourself by community and belonging. Feeling that togetherness in community dramatically helps our brain relax. We are tribal people. So withdrawing and isolating and saying no to everything and pulling away from all of your activities is likely to lead to poorer outcomes. Trying Which is probably the natural response when you're hurting. Yeah. Like you want to withdraw, you know, because you're like, I don't want to participate, but that exacerbates the problem. Totally. And it's really important to have purpose, have goals. So you need a life beyond your pain, beyond your vertigo, beyond your tinnitus. You need passion projects. You need purpose. You need things that are making you excited to wake up in the morning. So it's so important that you keep going deeper into your heart, into your meaning, into your purpose, into your values and making decisions based on how you want to be. What's the person you want to be? Because if every decision is on, will this impact my pain? Will this make my dizziness worse? But what about my tinnitus? If every decision is based on your symptoms, you are just yeah. going to end up spiraling down into a life of numbness, fear, avoidance, isolation, and, and ultimately depression, anxiety, and more symptoms. Yeah. So the route out is more, much more of a journey of pleasure, joy, connection, creativity, right? And all of this takes a bit of soul searching and this is the self-study and inquiry process of rock study that that my clients go through it's it's a step-by-step -step process and things that you used to love let's say five years ago you might have outgrown that it might have been hockey it might have been sewing it might have been guitar maybe that's not your thing anymore so you, mm -hmm. you got to be like what lifts me up find your joy and invest time into it and I think believe that the change is possible because when we're happy, joyous, connected in that place of loving, feeling loved, feeling lovable, the brain changes. The left and the right hemispheres of the brain actually share more information. There's more capacity for growth, for neuroplasticity, for healing, for problem solving. When we're in our pain and our fear and our fight, flight, freeze, stress zone in the sympathetic, things lock up and, and we get real narrow vision. Our creativity is not ideal. Our problem solving is not as good. And we get stuck. Yep. Like the brain's just like looking for that survival fight flight options and nothing else. It's not lateral. It's not big thinking. So all I can say is what's, what's your book? Should we plug your book? Oh, sure. It's called radiant relief, a case for a better solution to chronic pain. And you know, it's not, it's not, uh, I mean, it's a great book. It's an Amazon bestseller. Inc. Magazine wrote about it last month or in November, and they called it a manifesto and an epic example of how to create a movement. But it really, it's more of a, it's more of a, it's more of the story and the vision of what we intend to do with our business and, and address this problem because everything you're saying is hundred percent true, but the average person out there isn't where you and I are at, Joey. I mean, they're, they're just trying to survive. And unfortunately they've been indoctrinated because of, you know, pain is a very human experience. There's not one of us that doesn't experience pain. And so we develop some level of understanding ourselves around it being a very cause and effect, very indicative of something being wrong when in chronic pain, it's not really that way. And then that is reinforced through society. It's reinforced through, you know, the clinician, you know, the clinician experiences we have because these doctors mm. and clinicians are trained in old science. As a Western society, at least, I don't know about the rest of the world, we hate pain. We want to immediately pop a pill and mask yeah. it or do something else when pain is like the master teacher. Like it's there to get our attention for a specific reason. And yeah. if we ignore it, it's just going to make it worse. Like we need to become a little bit more empowered and comfortable to face the pain and understand what is the pain trying to tell me so that I can then resolve the pain much more. And like safely. from a yoga perspective, pain is the most eloquent, specific, sincere, and easy to hear mind body language when your body yeah. is talking to you pain is it's, it's at its clearest right 
Because when it's not painful and it's subtle, it's, it's like, what's going on there? I'm feeling something vague. But when it's pain, it's like, whoa, yeah, okay. Body's really talking to me right now. Right. And, and learning how to, to decode that body language and listen and listen to the wisdom. And again, coming back to birthing, it's totally normal to feel pain as your pelvis is opening and your sacrum is moving. And, and, and some women are able to actually transmute that pain in, into an interpreted signal that's, that's not interpreted in a bad way. It's normalized right. and it's, it's right. safe. And other women are told like medicate it, numb it, like, you know, and, and they go through that pain is bad philosophy when it's a, it's a completely natural process as your whole entire body is, is reshaping itself to, to deliver a baby. Mm-hmm. All of those signals your body are giving you are 100% evolutionarily designed. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I think this is where the education comes in. And also the, the medical world is really having to shift what it's been taught for the last hundred years. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I couldn't agree more, you know, and I think from a, from a business standpoint and not to talk too much about the business side of things, but because we have a technology piece, that technology piece allows us to make it scalable so that we can replicate it consistently. And it allows us to attract investor dollars. And it allows us because there's like something tangible, it's, it's, you know, it's a device. Right. And so that, that makes it some level of credibility to like the average, you know, investor or whatever, kind of group out there but again it's the person that heals and what what our goal is is to give education to give empowerment to help people feel better get them out of the urgency of the fire Mm -hmm. um and and then you know put them on a path in which they're then empowered to continue to make changes much more in tune with what their bodies are trying to tell them versus what we've been in condition from our own experiences from society and from healthcare you know over the last 50 100 years which is mass the pain yeah beautiful Yeah. So I think for everyone out there, the first step to healing is just having an awareness that there's something that you feel in this present moment that doesn't quite feel in alignment with your highest good. Okay. So it's like, "Mm, this is uncomfortable from that place. Ask yourself, where do I want to go? So A is painful. I want to get to B. I want to feel steady. I want to feel centered. I want to feel ease, calm, happy, whatever. Closing that gap is the journey of neuroplasticity. And that could look like anything. It could look like going to a radiant pain relief clinic and and investing in some support there. So you've got an avenue to get from A to B. It could be taking on a rock steady program like my client's doing and doing 12 weeks of self-study or joining support and peer groups where you can share the learning and share the journey. Could be buying a book and reading that, right? It could be you just ignore it and you just decide I'm going to stay at A and ignore this and never bother getting to B, right? The healing Mm -hmm. is the decision and the choice. The way you get there doesn't matter. That's your personal journey and your personal choice. So Brendan, it's been really great to chat with you. Always love talking about getting into a bit of the neuroscience and the human aspect of healing. And I think it's wonderful that you're providing options that can ease people away from um, medications and the pharmaceutical approach because every doctor I've ever spoken to says, Medicines are not for life. They are a temporary aid to yeah. help people gain life skills to, to, to manage better and reset, right? I've never met a doctor who's like, take this pill for life, see you later. And if that's what your doctor's saying, just get a second opinion because that's not what those medications are designed for. Right. So I just think it's great that there are options out there for people to help them reduce the medications and really use the robustness of their body and neuroplasticity with more finesse. Couldn't agree more. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you, Joy. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, so I'll pop a link in radiantpainrelief.com. And for those of you with chronic vertigo or tinnitus, visit my site, seekingbalance.com.au. There are loads of resources, programs, peer group, peer group support, you name it. Reach out if you're needing support because that's what I'm here for. And for those of you with pain relief, check out radiantpainrelief.com. Great. It's a bye for now. And thanks again, Brendan. Thank you. Cheers.